This is an ABC podcast. In families, there's often a story about an illustrious or mysterious relative, a great aunt or a grandfather or a long lost cousin who was more than they seemed to be, who had a secret life. They were either a spy or a secret criminal or a war hero. And these stories become part of family folklore, but you never quite know which elements are true or half true or outright fantasy. And the idea of a sweet old relative having a secret life is so tantalising. For Phil Kafkaloudis, this figure was his enigmatic grandmother, Olga. Phil grew up hearing stories about what she did during the Second World War in occupied Greece and in Egypt. Phil is a former ABC broadcaster. He was on Conversations recently talking about the illustrious history of Radio Australia. And that was when we realised that Phil had another story to tell, the story of Olga, his mother's mother. Some years ago, Phil went to Greece to look for traces of Olga's life during World War II to find out why she left her young family in Australia and whether she really did become a spy and kill someone in the line of duty. Hi, Phil. Hey, Richard. Tell me whereabouts in Greece your family comes from, Phil. Well, I had a grandfather who was married to Olga who came from an island of Castellorizu, which is the furthest flung island closest to the Turkish coast. She came from Athens, and on the other side of the family... There was people from Corfu, Kalamati. It was such a broad spread. So I feel like a United Nations. <laughs> of Greece, of right. Greece. <laughs> and, and did your parents meet there or in Australia? No, my parents met in Australia. They met in Darwin during the war at a little cafe that my uncle had called the Rendezvous. My uncle was Michael Paspalis, Paspali he became known as. So that they were really rich people. They were pearl The farmers. Paspali family, that right. That one, yeah, right. that's right. But that's not where you grew up. You didn't grow up in Darwin, no, did you? No, I grew you? up in Sydney in beautiful Dulwich Hill. Well, it's quite a gentrified suburb these days, but was it back then? No, it was more of a post-war immigration suburb. It was gentrified actually in the early parts of the um, 20th century, but by the time we came there, we dragged the suburb down and we had <laughs> all my friends. I didn't know religious difference or cultural difference. They, they were just Ross and George and Perry. and So it was it was a beautiful way to grow up to actually not understand that there was difference between cultures. Now, there is that cliche about big Greek extended families all getting mm. together, big family feasts together. What Was that nonetheless your family too? It was. It was. There were a lot of kids. One thing we all did as a family was get together for Easter and get together for New Year and, um, and the important Greek calendar days. My, my aunties, they could be really tough, but in a Greek, tough, loving way. Like how? How would, would they be tough with you? Well, they'd threaten to throw you down the stairs, for example. I remember, I remember that was one thing. I, I, you do that again, throw you down the stairs. And then if you burst into tears, they'd grab you and hug you to their breasts so tightly, you know. So there was this love, threat, love, <laughs> threat. It was wonderful at the time. <laughs> so so given that there were so many rellos around the, the table for these big, big family events mm-hmm. and there were grandparents, do you have recollections of meeting your grandmother? Olga? No, she actually died when I was very young, when I was a baby. Olga had come back from overseas in 1952 and she was going to look after me while my mum could go to work. And so everything was set up and then Olga died suddenly. So I didn't. She would have been one of those faces that I'm sure in my brain somewhere was looking over me in a cot. And I do remember Greek women looking at me as a as a very young child, but whether that was one of them was her, I don't know. But there was her legend. How did you sort of hear the legend of Olga as you grew up, Phil? Well, all of those get-togethers. The family would talk about her, saying, yeah, she was a spy in, in Greece in World War Two, and she killed people and she rescued people. That was what they seemed proudest of, was the rescuing of flyers. Um, there would be any of British, New Zealand, Australian soldiers caught behind the enemy lines in Greece. The Germans came down in 1941 from the north and there were many 
Allied soldiers that were just caught. Um, they'd go through the area and um, they, they had no way of getting out. So you're hearing these remarkable stories mm. about here. And did you think there was anything remarkable about it at the time? No. It was just part of part of life, you know. When they they said I was I was Greek, I went, oh yeah, that's great. In fact, um I remember my mum I said to my mum once, Am I when you mean I'm Greek? I'm you know, I feel Australian. I'm really Australian, I'm not Greek. And she said, Your blood she always went into a Greek accent, even though she was born here. <laughs> but when she started talking to her, she said, Your blood is one hundred percent Greek. And <laughs> I remember going to school and talking to my seven-year-old girlfriend, Glenda, and said, you know what? My blood's 100% Greek. And she vomited. Um, <laughs> oh, no, you're making that up, surely. No, she sort of went... <laughs> right. She dry She made that... Okay, uh, she dry uh, I went okay. a bit further. Right, okay. okay. <laughs> so there's this story circulating about Olga. How would they talk about her character, the kind of person she was? They were so proud. And they would talk about how she acted. They talked about the fact she knew six languages, the fact that she could fool the Germans because she could speak German. They were proud of her. They also spoke about her in such glowing terms, but there was always a bit of reserve. And it wasn't until a little bit later that I found what the reserve was. You know? Did you see photos of her as a kid? No. Actually, Richard, that's really interesting. I never ever saw a photograph of her as a kid. But when I started doing the research, I got heaps. And what does she look like in those photos? Well, as a young woman, she was gorgeous. She was a very pretty young girl, long black hair, enormous black eyes, stunning. In fact, the best way I could do it is like thinking about Sophia Loren, who said when she was very young, she was very gawky. She had big eyes, very skinny and lanky. And she called herself an ugly duckling. And, of course, as she grew up and the hormones kicked in, she just changed into this beautiful woman. And Olga did too when she was, you know, 20, 21, 22. Then she had five children. So she changed enormously over different periods of her life. So, as you say, she grew up in Alexandria. Yeah on the Mediterranean, part of Egypt, and it is famously a city founded by Alexander the Great. Yes. Greek people have been living there in, ever since. In, yep. in ancient times, it was famously bigger and more beautiful than the city of Rome yeah. uh, as a great trading city. And in those years between the war, it was also famously cosmopolitan and rich. Did she have that kind of air of refinement and cosmopolitanism about her? She certainly did. She abs In fact, I found photographs of her with my mum, my auntie Frida and my uncle Nicky and their hairstyles were astounding. I mean, they were 12, 13 and the clothes were just perfect. She had style. You're a journalist mm. and mm. trained as a journalist. When did you get beyond that thinking that, oh, yeah, who doesn't have a, a grandmother who was a wartime <laughs> spy who executed traitors and realised as a journo that... There's a story here. Well, the very first part of what you said then was when I went to Greece for the first time and it was in 1988 and I went with Jackie, who was Welsh, and we got married there. We thought, ah, we'll just get married there. Did all the paperwork I needed back here, I thought, and we went to Greece and we arrived at the old airport midnight. One o'clock, we got into our hotel. There's a guy standing behind the desk I'm excited. Jack's really annoyed. And we go up to the, the counter and he's signing papers and I said, yeah, the name's Kafka Ludis. Oh, yeah, OK, yes, we have a room for you on second floor. <laughs> and, I, and I couldn't help myself and I said, my grandmother was a spy in Greece in the Second World War. I had to tell somebody in Greece, right? And he didn't look up and he just went, everybody's grandmother was a spy <laughs> in Greece in World War II, second floor. <laughs> you know, and that was... In, re in retrospect, you, you think about how he said it. Was it like everybody says their grandmother was a spy in Greece in World War II? No, everybody's grandmother was the, from one side or the other. N it was just no neutrality. It was as it was nothing special. Right? It, was, it was nothing special. Right. Everybody did that. So then you decided to go on a quest to find Olga, who yeah. she really was, mm -hmm. and to trace and see how much of the story was real or how mm -hmm. much you could find out was real. Mm -hmm. What were the big questions you had in your mind, Phil? Well, was it true? I'd been a journalist for some years by that stage and you know people tell you things and you know that people sometimes will take someone else's life as their own. A lot of people in Central Europe particularly invented whole stories of how 
they were working with resistance when, in fact, they'd been collaborators yes. all along. Did, did you allow yourself that thought? I did. And I got all my aunties together and I said, tell me the stories, tell me what she told you, oral history, right? And I got them all together and they would tell stories and I would try to find the confluence of the three stories. In fact, the best way to do it now would be get them individually so they don't sort of, yeah, that's what she said and, you know, it's... But at the same time, it was good to have them together because they contradicted each other and they added to each other's stories. So, you know, mum would say something and then Frieda would go, no, 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 no. So there was a story. I'll give you an example. There was a story... Olga was standing in a queue in a bakery in Athens and she saw two paces ahead of her a collaborator and the collaborator looked back and saw her and she realised there was something here. He He clocked her. uh, He clocked her and by him seeing her placed her in great danger. He left and she decided she has to take care of him. She has to stop him. And so she followed him, according to my mum, to a laneway and shot him. And my auntie Tina said, no, 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 no. No, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. It was a butcher's shop. And I went, okay, well, that's fine. doesn't matter. Butcher, baker, that's fine. It was a butcher's shop. She was with another person and the person in front, who was three paces in front, by the way, and I'm going, oh, here we go saw them together and that was the issue. So they then followed him as he left and Olga stabbed him to death in a laneway. I went, well, okay, so she killed him. All right, okay, I I can draw enough things together on that. And then my auntie Frida said, no, 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 you're both wrong. (laughs) You're both wrong. It was in Paris anyway. Okay, what was it? What do you mean it's in Paris? You know, what was it so... Now she was in Paris, you know, so there were so many of these doubts about these stories that they would tell me. But the fact was that there were so many of them. But I've got to tell you, I found that there was something more to this, that this wasn't just Olga making this stuff up. So you're hearing all this stuff. You're hearing that Olga very likely was a spy. Mm. Working for whom? Yeah, well, she was trained, according to all the stories, by the British, taught how to kill, taught how to rescue. Now, when you say working for the British, do you know if that might or was MI6 or the you know, SIS, the Special Intelligence Services, that, as it used to be called, or the Special Operations Executive? Because, you know, MI6 was about intelligence, getting mm, secrets, yeah. but the Special Operations Executive was about blowing up things, essentially, and sabotage. Do you know, do you have an idea of who she may have or did work for? No, not. I don't have any documents about who she worked for necessarily, but... Looking at what they, I mean, had to do a lot of research, and this was in the 90s, about who did what and who trained who at any certain time for what purpose. It came that it had to be special operations executive doing training for what it was that her primary purpose was. And that primary purpose was the rescue of these flyers and soldiers caught behind the enemy lines because the rescue wasn't just go to a a house, knock on a door and grab the, the Australian flyer and then run through a field with them. It was far more than that. It had to be a network and it was a network that was involved with the um, Greek resistance, Elas, Elam, and these guys all worked together. Even though some were communists, some were royalists, they still worked together at various points during the war to get these people out. And they worked with Special Operations Executive. And um, there were a couple of memoirs that were done by people, by the British soldiers who were there at the time. There's a lot of oblique references to helping people with the escapes and, and working with these locals to get these people out. Let's go right back mm. to the start of Olga's life. Mm. What's her origin story? She was a foundling. She was given away. She was a child who had no home. Her mother wanted to give her away. An unwanted daughter. She was an unwanted daughter. And there was a woman in Alexandria who had worked as a seamstress to the Greek royal family and she dearly wanted a child. And so she took the child and took her to Alexandria 
which must have been a fabulous place to grow up because it was like the Shanghai of the Middle East, you know. There were so many different cultures mixing in there. There's some photographs of Olga on a beach in Alexandria, you know, sitting there with, with her mother. Mother had Sadeki and she was a, quite a Renaissance woman. She encouraged Olga to do her amateur acting, to learn the, the languages and to go to university. And so the plan was for Olga to do that. And know? did she go to university? No, because my grandfather, Michael Stambolis, he came somehow, I don't know how, it's the, the Greek connection thing, found out about her, came from Australia to marry this young woman that he'd heard about. So how he heard about, I don't know. And he said, I'm from Australia, I'm Greek. I have a seafood restaurant in Sydney. Will you marry me? It was simple as that. Olga's mother had mother had Sadeki didn't want her to marry him. She wanted her to go to university. She was actually apparently quite broken hearted by it. But she said, yes, grass is always greener. So she wanted to come and be part of this seafood restaurant. And what was the seafood restaurant a in Sydney? A fish and chip shop. It was yeah, a fish, a and, fish chip and chip shop. shop. So she leaves glamorous Alexandria for this promise on the other side of the world and he gets there and she's she's expected, I suppose, to work and help run a fish and chip shop in Piermont in Sydney. And also expected to have children. I didn't know my grandfather either, but everybody says that he was such a beautiful man. However, they worked a fish and chip shop, you know, strangling chickens, um, battering saveloys, you know. Life just went that way right through the 20s for her and she had five children in pretty quick succession. Tough existence, you think? It was a tough time, though. Yeah. Hot work, hard work. Yeah. What, six, seven days a week yep. in a fish and chip shop? Yeah. So her old life must have seemed like a dream to her it then. must have. I'm sure there were times where she thought, I wish I'd gone to university, <laughs> you know, and stayed in Alexandria, gone to university. I mean, Alexandria was no, you know, bunch of roses either. It was, you know, a pretty tough place. Still, she'd had experience as an amateur actress, she mm. wanted to go to university mm. and here she is on the other side of the planet. It, Not using it, any of those skills. And and five children, yeah. five children. Yeah. And while she was there in Sydney in 1930, you write that she got a letter from Greece. Tell me about that letter and what was in that letter. The letter was from her mother, the mother who had given birth to her and said, we miss you, we want you to come back, we really need to see who you are, we would love to connect with you again. How, how have they tracked her down in Sydney? Well, probably the same kind of network that led my grandfather to find out about her in Alexandria. Like a Greek was, bush telegraph or it something. It is the yeah. most amazing bush mm. telegraph. There were people, I've got letters that people have sent. I've been researching my, my dad as well. And people from Egypt sending him letters 30 years after he left Greece, saying, you know, I have a, a son who's coming to Australia. Could you find him a job? Okay, who are these people? He said, I don't know. I've never met them before. But they are cousins. The name's right. So how did that happen? No one said someone told me about you. And so I just, you just, one of those things you just let ride. You so know? most likely the birth family got in touch with the family that brought her up in Alexandria and they said, oh, she's gone to Sydney and they found her there. Could be. That's one explanation. Could be one. So the letter was, you know, we love you, we um, we want to see you again. It was all very joyful. And in fact, the letter made the newspapers. I don't know how. I found, I found there was an article about that in a Tasmanian newspaper. Tasmanian? A Tasmanian newspaper. What I think it was, and this has been such an interesting thing about studying how media reported, I would assume, because they're in Harris Street, right, Ultimo, Piemont, and, you know, of course, just nearby you've got the Sydney Morning Herald. It could just be a reporter came in on the day she got this letter and everyone's talking about it <laughs> and he just wrote down a few notes. I'm assuming it would be something like right. that. Right, the SMH didn't print it, but, no, no. but someone and in Tassie picked it up. passed it on to right. the others, you know. Right. They just, you know, they went, oh, we don't have any room for this sort of stuff. Who cares, you know. So Olga left to go to Athens, taking my mum, Nelly, with her, who was at that time eight, and her baby, Christopher, who is not long newborn. So they go. And so they arrive there and my mum had actually knitted for her new half-sister a little teddy bear. And so she gave it to her grandmother 
and she threw it away and said, is that all you've got for us? This what? is according to my mum who remembered it very well and she said they were horrible. They threw the teddy bear. They said, no, you can't stay with us. And so they said, have you got any money for us? And Olga was like, well, I'll have a little, you know. So, okay, well, you can't stay here with us anyway, so go and find a place. And my mum says, I still remember, she said, I, I, I remember we had to go and find somewhere to stay that very day. My mum had a, a baby on her arm and me and our suitcases and they closed the door and we had to go and find somewhere else to stay. What kind of life did they think she was living in Sydney then if they said, Se where's your money? Seafood restaurant. It came through that, that you know, they had this great restaurant chain probably. The way it goes through the Greek Bush Telegraph probably is, you oh. know, he was Rupert Murdoch of the day, you know. But at the time there was great poverty in Greece and um, the sort of poverty probably that led them to giving her up in the first place. And they went, whoa, she's done okay, let's get her back, you know. It wasn't very pleasant at all. So this awful reunion with her birth family takes mm. place in Athens mm. with her little baby mm. and your mum. Tell me what happened to that little baby. Everyone in the family agrees what happened to the baby. Olga stayed there for some months. She found a job. And the one thing that her family did for her was they looked after the baby while she worked. My mum went to a school. But in the family was a half-sister, my mum said, uh, who was playing with the baby one day. And this, this girl who had an intellectual disability fed my, he would have been my uncle, but he was a baby, Christopher, cogs from a sewing machine, fed him those to eat and the baby died. That's what killed him. When Olga came back from work, they said, the baby's disappeared. I don't know where the baby's gone. The baby had died. That one incident affected everything that Olga and her husband Michael and my parents, how their lives went from that point. It was like a total kink in their existence, the death of that baby. So what happened when she came back to Australia without the baby and just your mum? Yeah, hand. she came back and Michael, her husband, tried to put a good face on it, apparently. And uh, they slept together in the same bed. They never touched. It was the coldest of marriages. Of course, deep down, something in him blamed her. He didn't want her to go to see the family anyway in the first place. But, you know, he said, if you really need to, go. So there must have been blame because there just was no marriage from that point onwards. They worked together. They brought up the children. They did that for several years. But it was really a terribly unhappy existence. And I surmise at this stage that there was, there became some kind of mental illness with Olga over that period, more than just depression. Um, my mum remembers in the early 30s, that Olga put them all into a truck, the, the truck that my grandfather had, was using for the shop, and drove them somewhere. And as they were driving down Harris Street, he ran up next to them and grabbed her and grabbed the keys and said, no, you don't have to do this. You don't do this. You love your children. You know, my mum remembers that. I mean, she would have been 12. Her memory of it is was really stark, that she, Olga, was going to kill them all. They were just going to drive off a cliff or something, you know? Your mum has that recollection. Yeah. Yeah. So by now we get to 1936. War hasn't yet broken out. No. But the clouds are there. Yep. So she decided to leave in 1936. She made the decision that it was better to leave her family than to risk them. I mean... Again, surmising, and I've got to say this, this is I'm surmising, that she decided it was better to leave the family than to be there. If she as a mother could consider hurting her children, 
then it was better for her not to be there. So where did she go? She went to Greece. She left the children with Michael, my, my grandfather. Yeah. She decided just to go. Podcast, broadcast and online. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. So she decided to leave in 1936. She left the children behind and went to Greece. Yeah. War broke out in 1939. Yeah. Then Greece was invaded first by Italy and then by the Germans in 1941. Mm. How was she recruited into espionage work? What do you know of that? I know very little about how and who recruited her. But she was working in diplomatic circles. She'd worked for the French, she'd worked for British, and by 1941 she was working for the Americans. I have passes that, you know, this is the first documentary trail that I have that she worked for various people in these embassies. Did she have language skills? Yeah, she spoke six languages, French, German, English, Greek and two others. She had an amazing set of skills that would have been very good for her in that environment. So then in 41, the Germans invade Greece. It's a really ugly campaign. The Greeks had pushed Italy out through Albania um, when no one expected them to, and that was a real egg on the face for Mussolini. Greece took one for the world because it forced Hitler to invade Greece to save Mussolini's face, the, ac the face for the Axis powers. And it forced Hitler to put off his invasion of it's Russia. Oh, the Soviet Union. Extraordinary. But anyway, yes, yeah, so they came down. Um, Greece eventually capitulated. And so there was a Greek government which was seen as a collaborationist government. They were seen as very weak. The Greek uh, prime minister shot himself. So in the middle of all this... It seems your grandmother, Olga, was working with resistance forces mm. in Greece to help downed Allied airmen out of the country into safety. What did that mean? Where, where would they be taken? What would happen was they would be taken from wherever they were in the north of Greece, the north, the west of Greece. They would be taken to a port of departure somewhere on the east coast. The cell that she worked for was based in Athens and they would get them onto boats, usually at night. They would then go across the Mediterranean to Cairo. Not just once. They did it again and again and again. OK, now you did discover that at some point in 1941, just a few months after the Germans had invaded Athens, Olga was picked up and arrested by the Germans. What happened to her? She was arrested, taken to the German headquarters in Athens and interrogated. And this is where her acting came into it. And my mum used to act the way Olga told her the story. She acted like a peasant, the shoulder hunched, and she just didn't give them anything. And so the Germans got up, there were two Germans, they got up and went to the other side of a, it was a plywood wall, and you could hear everything through it. And Olga, who could speak German, heard them saying, look, we know she was in Piraeus on the night of the 15th. <laughs> if she denies it, then we have her. And they think she's a peasant. She thinks she's a little peasant. And can't understand German. Yeah, they can't understand German. Wow. They came back in mm. and they said, where were you on the night of the 15th? The 15th? I don't know. Which night was the 15th? I don't know. It was last Sunday. Last Sunday. I don't know. La last Sunday. I think I was just at... Oh, no. No, I went to Piraeus. I had to drop something off for a friend in Piraeus. I had to... I was... I'm sorry. Did I break your curfew? I'm so sorry. I didn't... I will never do it again. Is that what this is about? The curfew? I'm so... And the, apparently the two Germans got up in a half and said, get out. And she should have just gone down the stairs and got out of there, right? As any sane person would. 
she went to the lift and she stood there and she pressed the button and said, I'm going to get the lift down. I'm going to take this very slowly and get out of here. Now, that could have been just a very clever move on her part. A guilty person would just go, oh, God, I'm out. But while she was there, the, the, one of the soldiers, one of the, the German officers saw her and said, I'll throw her in the prison anyway. And they imprisoned her at a place called Averroff Prison in North Athens and she was there for six months. During that six months... They didn't know if it was day or night. It was in a, the lower cells below ground and regularly women would be taken out of the cells, taken up and they wouldn't come back again or they would hear shots. They were just shot in the, you know, in the front yard of Averroff Prison. People came in, women came in and they looked after each other. They had a trough where they used to wash each other and help each other. Eventually she was released. It, this was still 1941, end of forty-one. So she hadn't been working very long because the Germans invaded in April 41. So when she got out, she had been, before she went to prison, given a house by an ambassador she had worked with. The ambassador was getting out in, early in the war and she said, can I stay still in the house? Because she stayed in the house with them. And the ambassador said, you can have the house and gave her a paper and the key and gave her this house in a place called Pendeli. And apparently it was a beautiful house and he gave her a car and he gave her all these things at the beginning of the war. When she got out of prison, it was in the middle of the famine in Greece, so she was basically walking over bodies. And when she went back to Pendeli, the house had been occupied by the Germans. They took the house. Maybe that was one of the reasons they wanted to arrest her. She had this great house, you know, with a great view. But she survived jail for six months. You had a photo of her. What did you do with that photo? So this photo, she was wearing a uniform. It looks almost like an Australian uniform with rolled up sleeves, very light colour. It's black and white. A military sepia. uniform, it's right. It's a military uniform with a cap. And the family didn't know what this uniform was. So I took this photo to all the centres and everyone I asked, like military museums, I'd ask, you know, do you recognise this uniform? they go, no, I'm sorry, I don't understand... I've never seen that before. And I was looking for any recognition of this uniform. Zero. Went to Yanina in the far west. Zero. All these other places, Papingo, Mikuru Papingo, all these little towns. Zero. Until I'm just about to get to Thessaloniki in the north. And just outside Thessaloniki is a little town. And there was an army surplus store. And I went... Oh, can't hurt. So I went in and there's a guy, it's like the guy in The Simpsons who runs the the, car, yeah. the, the comic shop here in a, in a bun and, and all that. And I said, you wouldn't by any chance recognise this. And he went, oh, yes, it's a Greek naval uniform, 1941. In fact, I have that very hat here. And on his shelf he had it. He had the same hat with the same badge that Olga had. It was a Greek naval uniform from 1941. And he looked at the photograph and he said, ah, oh, yes, this would have been taken on the water by the looks of it. And I said, where did you see that? You know, and he said, look, you can see the horizon. I was just thinking, I just naturally thought it was just a line through the photograph. And I went, he's right, you know. So I go to a museum in Thessaloniki and there's a long corridor in the museum and I'm walking up the corridor and I saw a bust at the very end of the corridor and blow me down if it doesn't look like my grandmother. And I get up really close and I go, oh, no, it's not quite, actually. But it is a woman, her name was Leela Karianis. Now, Leela was the granddaughter or the great-granddaughter of a woman who was a Greek national hero, Bubalina. She led the resistance against the Turks in 1823, I think. I might have the year wrong. But she led the resistance. She killed people and she, you know, she was a major figure. So Leela is her descendant. And so I'm looking at this and, and there's Leela's story. And it said... Leela led a cell called Bubalina after her great-grandmother and what they did is they rescued British, Australian, New Zealand soldiers, took them to the coast, put them on ships, went with them to Cairo. So this woman looks a bit like your grandmother and has done the same things your grandmother was reputed to have done during the war. What yeah. did you think when you saw that? Well, the first thing I thought was that there is actually now a documented story of someone who did what Olga claimed 
to do. My disappointment was I thought, this is Thessaloniki. She didn't work out of Thessaloniki. She worked out of Athens. So obviously there are cells that were doing that. I was later to find, and I did some research over the next few days, is that Leela actually did operate out of Athens. So I have taken the assumption that Olga would have worked for her, that the cell, the Bubalina cell that rescued these people, that's the cell that Olga would have worked with. I don't think they would have had like four or five different cells. It's not like Optus versus Telstra. This would have been the cell that she would have worked with. That's my assumption. So then we know the story that you've heard from all your aunties that at some point she might have been spotted in the queue at a butcher or a Mm. baker or somewhere and gone out alone or with someone else and killed this collaborator, either with a gun or with a knife. It's all mm. it's all very maddeningly imprecise. Yes. Did you go to Britain? Did you try and find her in the British war records? Yeah, Clanethley, which was in Wales, is where they had the British um, records, but nothing. I was in contact with them several times, but again, nothing. Um, there was a maddening shortage of information And I must say, at various times, I went, did she just make this up? Did she claim to do it? A photograph of her in uniform on a ship, that could have been taken any time. If she was, for argument's sake, a collaborator, then that could explain also that photograph. You know, she could have just been with a German soldier or something and had a photograph taken on a boat. So, yeah, there was certainly, up to that point, there was no certainty that um, she did what she said. Is she mentioned at all in British records, in Foreign Office records? No, Not no, at all? No. There's, that she doesn't exist in any way, no, shape or form no. there at all? Like so many other Greeks, they just did not get any recognition. But that, that's, you know, to be expected in this situation. But did you wonder that rather than working in Lena Kariaki's cell in Athens, that she might have just appropriated her whole story and take it on herself? Yeah, I did. To cover whatever it is she did, she really did during the war. Yeah, I did. Do you think that's possible? No. Why not? One of the stories my mum told me. We're talking here about 1942, after Olga left. My grandfather had Olga declared dead, and married a woman named Jean, and had two children very quickly, and one night. In the fish and chip shop, there was a knock on the glass. Jean answered the door and said, look, we're closed now. What what can I do for you? Now, this soldier who's standing outside the door had got out, out of Greece. And the soldier said, I have a message for Nellie. And it's from her mother, Olga. Now, if you could just imagine what this must have been for Jean. Her husband's upstairs asleep. She's got two children. She comes down thinking that her husband's ex-wife is dead and this person has just told her that she's alive and I got a message. The message is for Nellie, my mum, the, the oldest daughter. And Jean, lovely lady, went up, woke my mum and said, there's a man here who says he's got a message from Olga. He wants to talk to you. And my mum said, no, I don't want to see him. I don't want to see him. She was very nervous. And she went, no, I don't want to see him. And Jean said, you've got to go down. You've got to find out what's happened with your mum. You know, you've got to go and speak to him. And she refused. And Jean apparently kept trying. Jean told me this and my mum told me this. In the end, she gave up, went back to the soldier who's still standing outside the door and said, I'm really sorry. Nellie's not going to come down. She doesn't want to come down. And the soldier almost cried and said, I have to pass this message on. Olga rescued me. She saved me. She brought me to Cairo. And she said, if you get back to Sydney, this is the address. See my daughter, Nellie, and tell her I'm okay. And Jean must have said something like, I'll pass it on or something. That incident of this person saying, Olga rescued me, saved me, 
and wanted me to pass a message on is the one thing that makes me know Olga did what she said she did. And this was an Australian serviceman? Yep. And both your mother and your step-grandmother told you that story? Then. Yeah. But I've, I've, got to, I've got to actually say there were a lot of people who did a lot of things in the war and it doesn't really surprise me in Greece that somebody who had no family, Olga had, you know, she had her birth family there but they weren't linked together. Her real family, the ones she cared about, were in Australia. She could speak the languages, she could act. She was on her own. She was a single woman. She is the perfect person to be, you know, doing that sort of thing. When you think how many people did, people in almost every family did something in the war. So it's not like a very big underground thing. Everyone, as that person in the hotel, Fedra, said to me, everybody's grandmother was a spy in Greece. So, (laughs) You You know, I've read so many memoirs from people who served in whatever war and one thing that they often say at the end was that person who did those extraordinary things... I don't recognise that person that I was back then. Did I really do all those things? Yes. So people have, and they have to go back and have these quite by the standards of the war, much less exciting, perhaps more fulfilling but more mundane lives. You said that Olga did come back to Australia yeah. after the war. Yeah. Did she just show up one day or was she invited back? Oh, the story is after the war she worked for the American ambassador. His name was... Purifoy, John Purifoy, who in himself is a very interesting man. But it was during a very difficult time. There was a Greek civil war and the royalists and the communists were fighting each other. In fact, I think there were more deaths from the civil war than there were in the war. And Olga made the decision then. She got a letter from my mum, who at that stage in 1952 was now 30 and had children. I've got the letter. It's quite an extraordinary letter. It says, you're welcome to come back, but... Always remember, we will side with the man who looked after us, not with the person who let us stay here by ourselves to be motherless and to suffer indignity at school because our mother walked out on us and people telling us things that we weren't worthy. Our mother didn't think we were worthy of being looked after. And and then she says in the next letter, but all of that is forgotten, <laughs> which I can't help. Mum, wow. all you, of that is forgotten. You ran out on us. You didn't bring us up. Our dad did it. We suffered indignity and humiliation. But please, come home. Come yeah, back. That's right. And that's what she said. It was time for her to come back. So she did come back to Australia yep. where she saw your mum again and took up a role in the family as the grandmother. Well, it's, when she was on her way back in 1952, and this is one of the poignant parts of the story, my grandfather, Michael, died, died of a heart attack. So they never saw each other again. You know, when she left in 36, that was the last time she was ever to see him. But Jean was there and they got on very well, surprisingly. They met at the, um, the airport. The grandchildren were there and all the kids and all that. And my mum was the one who didn't embrace her so well, even though she sent the letter, all this is forgotten. It clearly wasn't. But after a while, they became very close. But it took a while. It took quite a while. I... It, it sounds like that having heard Olga's war stories, that helped your mum forgive her or understand her. Do you think that's right, Phil? Well, when you consider when I was a child, they would talk, they'd brag about these stories that she did, the things that she did. Maybe, yeah. There was, because I I tend to think that, that she found redemption. She found some sort of balance in her life. Clearly, she'd had a really bad mental state when she left and she put it into service. And so when she came back, she had found some balance it was now up to her to help find my, my mum's balance. And I've got to say, my mum and my aunties, who I adored, I'm sure they were all affected emotionally by I've one auntie who was very tough. They all had their own little difficulties. All the children, all of Olga's children had difficulties and um, nothing extreme, but you could see people who had had their mother walk out on them, that it, it did affect them and they all admitted that. So... Olga coming back, back into their lives, having a a story about having done something good was probably, you know, it did a lot of healing, I think. 
Does it burn you that you never could get to know her? Wouldn't it have been amazing if she'd lived long enough for you to get to know her as a little kid? You know what it is? The thing about this is no, the fact that she died when I was very little, I wonder more about the people in the more distant past. And I do this when I, when I talk at writers' festivals or whatever, and I say, what was my great-grandmother like? Who from the different parts of my family fought against the Turks in the 20s or in the First World War or there was... Or the 19th century and uh, on it goes. And back, did they know Aristotle? You know, how far (laughs) back can you go? But it would have been great to know. But I think I've kind of let that... I mean, I have lived with her life for so long, having not actually spoken to her, but my sister Sylvia, 17 years older than me. So when Olga came back in 1952, Sylvia, my sister, was, um, what, 10 or 9 or something. And, again, my mum was working. And so Olga took charge of Sylvia, my sister, and she would do things like... Remember, Olga had seen a lot of bad behaviour. She wasn't going to put up with Australianism. So um, she took Sylvia to ballet classes once and you had to pay a shilling or two shillings or something for ballet classes. And um, they were waiting in a long queue to go in and there were women standing at the front. They'd pay their two shillings and they were just folding their arms apparently and chatting and meanwhile the class had started and... You know, when everyone else was standing in the queue very politely and not saying anything, Olga just said, to hell with this, grabbed Sylvia by the arm. Sylvia was mortified, went to the front, slapped the two shillings down and went in. Now, I mean, you know, it's it's a little tiny, tiny thing. But Sylvia still says today that she was horrified and so proud of this tough woman who just went... I'm not putting up with this. I've had guns to my head. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be standing in a queue. Phil, it's been an amazing story to hear from you. Thank you so much for sharing this story today. Richard, it's always great talking to you. Thanks. Phil Kafkaloudis is a former ABC broadcaster and he turned Olga's story into a novel that he published in 2011 called Someone Else's War. I'm Richard Feidler. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. Earshot is back with a new season called Follow Me. Meet a doomsday cult leader. When these chastisements happened, hell would be opened and all the devils would walk the earth. I mean, loving the cure now. Diehard music fans. At the tender age of 52. (laughs) And a mother trying to keep her daughter safe and sane online. Restricting and banning just hasn't worked. Come follow Earshot on the ABC Listen app. What path can I follow to not feel this anymore?